Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with my old dear pal and landscape architect, author, and professor, Baker Morrow, to talk about trees and the importance that they have in a city like ours, especially a desert city like ours that finds itself in the 14th year or so of a, of a great Western American drought of historic proportions. Baker is the principal of Morrow Reardon Wilkinson Miller uh, Limited, uh, fellow of the American Society of Architects, Landscape Architects, and the author of so many books it's impossible to remember them all, uh, but they include best plants of, uh, for New Mexico gardens and landscapes and canyon gardens, the ancient Pueblo landscapes of the American Southwest, which we did together, I'm proud to say. His company has, um, has uh, completed about 3,000 projects, I read on his website, including uh, the Big Eye, the award-winning Journal Center, and uh, the Albuquerque Academy campus. He's also uh, one of the founders, or the founder, of the School of Landscape Architecture at the University of New Mexico. It's great to have you here, old friend, and, and to talk today about trees. Thanks, Barrett. It's great to be here this afternoon with you. So I know you and I believe in trees. I know that we both think trees are probably among the most beautiful things in the world. And I also know that we, we both have, have similar feelings about their usefulness. I was really happy and, and kind of surprised to learn that you, that you and your company are doing about 100 and, 163 miles, did you say, of landscaped medians around Albuquerque. I know one of them. I drove up on uh, Second Street and saw this, these beautiful kind of small, wonderful urban forest up, up the middle of the, of the street. And I'm wondering, um, could you tell us, as a landscape architect, architect the, the role that trees play in the life of a city? Always a good question, Barrett. Uh, trees do a number of things in a city. They provide a lot of shade, of course, and that's what everybody thinks of right off the bat. But uh, if you think of them as the, the uh, green canopy above us, you also have to think about the fact that they have a wonderful ability to absorb uh, an enormous quantity of, of carbon dioxide, CO2. So in a city, just about any city, you have a lot of cars, of course, and in addition to the people and the animals in the city, cars consume vast amounts of oxygen. So the more trees we plant, the better the chance we have of offsetting the oxygen depleting uh, work of people and cars, automobiles, uh, all around a town. And trees are uniquely able to take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen in return. But lots of people say they're, they're the lungs of the city. Oh, and you hear that same comment about parks, of course, but there's almost no plant that will uh, purify the air within the city, generate oxygen uh, very effectively, and uh, contribute to cooling off a city. There's, a, there's almost no plant that does that as well as a tree. And trees also take up surprisingly small amounts of space. If you think about it, they're, they're supported on one or two trunks, three trunks, with a triple trunk or multi-trunk specimen. And there's this entire leafy canopy suspended above the ground. So we walk around under trees and we walk past them or we drive past them. And all these benefits that trees are providing to us actually come about without them taking up much urban space at all. In fact, it's, it's just the base of the trunk that we, we're really concerned with. It's not like a lawn or a, right. or an entire park space or uh, a whole series of of grasses, let's say, that, that really does um, occupy a, a fairly large amount of space within the city. So you drive around town and you see um, numbers of people who have decided to uh, let their trees go to, to, uh, uh, to save water. And you see a, uh, not a tremendous number, but every now and again it's very conspicuous. You see a terrible dead tree. And I've always sort of thought that that was the wrong strategy, uh, particularly when you have trees around a house. It, it, uh, I would think that it would cause um, a person to use a lot less water and a lot less electricity cooling their house if they, if they have shade. So I guess my question to you is, is, is our trees... Um, um, easily 
uh, kept up in a drought like ours? I mean, uh, do you uh, do you actually have to spend more water to keep them going, or, or are they adaptive to it? You know, Barrett, I've heard that question several times in recent months and years. What about all these trees that seem to be suffering because of people uh, doing the right thing and uh, reducing their water use in outdoor spaces? And what we have noticed the last few years is that people in the city of Albuquerque have worked very hard to make Albuquerque a, a more water efficient city. So back when we thought in the 50s and 60s that we had an unlimited amount of underground water, you would find a lot of front lawns and backyard lawns uh, all around the city. People maintained their lawns very well and they placed trees and shrubs around the edges of the lawns or trees in the middle of the lawns. And the trees did uh, quite well to the to the uh, naked eye, they seem to do quite well. But a couple of interesting things have come about because the city has increased its water efficiency so much. We're using much less water per capita than we did 10 years ago. And so what's happened is the, the lawns have begun to disappear. We're depending more on parks and playing fields for our open green space, which is all well and good. That's exactly what we should be doing. But in reducing the amount of, of lawn area, the trees that were flourishing in those lawns are sometimes suffering. And so those are the dead trees that you're talking about are the dying trees. When you re, uh, reduce the amount of lawn in a landscape, it's always good to remember that you have to continue to water your trees. And you do that very effectively. You can do it with drip watering systems if you want. You go out to the edge of the tree's canopy, where the branches actually end, the edge of the canopy and install a series of, of drip emitters, let's say, mm -hmm. and water the tree thoroughly once or twice a week during the growing season for several hours with the drip emitters, you'll find your trees will do quite well, even if, they're, uh, if the ground underneath them is covered up with gravel, let's say, or, mm -hmm. or some kind of mulch. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to remember that you have to continue to water the trees, even if you've removed the grass that uh, uh, formerly surrounded them. Yeah. Now, on to my second point, which is to keep bluegrass in good condition or fescue in good condition, you generally have to water about 50 inches a year, 45 to 50 inches of water a year. Wow. So by eliminating grassy lawns, we've eliminated a lot of that water use. But as luck would have it, the 40 or 50 inches a year were about twice as much as the trees ever needed in ah. the first place. So when, when the lawn is removed and uh, a new landscape is placed around the base of a tree, it's important to remember to water the tree, but you're never going to go back to that massive overwatering that was the case with bluegrass and fescue. You're, gonna, you're, you're going to be somewhere right in the middle, and really, since you're just irrigating a tree, it's, it's going to be good for it. it. It will be in good shape. One way that... Uh, you can work with our, our clay soils, which are so common in the central Rio Grande Valley, is to think about taking three or four three-foot lengths of PVC pipe, and you cut notches in the pipe all along the three or four-foot length. You get an auger, and you drill holes down into the ground out near the, uh, the edge of the canopy, the drip line of the, of the trees, and you put the, the tubes down into the ground. And that's a good place to put your emitters because you can fill up those tubes with gravel and the water will soak down into the ground three or four feet and the tree roots will chase the water. And that's a very good way to make sure your trees are uh, kept in good condition into the foreseeable future. Most of our urban trees will last 100 years if we, no if we take good care of them, yeah. So I find it hard to imagine what a city would be like without any trees. Um, if if a, a city is already a heat sink with trees, what kind of a place would it be? And and I guess I guess the hard question is is there were, is there really a chance that uh, in a protracted drought um, and uh, with serious uh, uh, climate change temperatures soaring? that a city could lose a large part of its urban forest? Barrett, we have so many good techniques for 
taking care of trees these days uh, that I don't think it is possible. I, I th yeah, I, I think that that uh, we can retain water as runoff that comes off buildings. Lots of people like rain barrels these days. Here in New Mexico up until September, I would have said any rain barrel that you set up would catch both drops <laughs> that, that fell between February and, and let's say August. But uh, we had a, a very nice series of September storms and everybody I know who has rain barrels had water to spare, lots of water. So many people are thinking in terms of collecting water in uh, and, and its runoff and utilizing that sort of water uh, to keep uh, our urban forests and urban landscapes in good condition. Secondly, our ordinances and laws are changing around the Southwest. It's legal in New Mexico now to use gray water for landscape irrigation. You can recycle water. So gray water, of course, is uh, the water that you use to rinse the dishes, the water that you use maybe to wash your hands, that sort of thing. And that can be collected and reused in uh, outdoor landscape uh, spaces to very good effect. And so that kind of recycling has become legally possible as, as well as technically easy to accomplish. Hmm. That being said, there's no drier part of New Mexico, let's say, than Albuquerque. It gets less water even than white sands, really? which is unimaginable, but, yeah. but white sands gets maybe 9 or 10 inches a year in an average year. Albuquerque these days, 7 to 8. Wow. So we are drier than anywhere else in New Mexico. And our challenge is to think of good ways to capture water and not let it go until we've used it three or four times. So we use it to prepare vegetables for supper. We, we wash our hands with it, it goes out to the garden, and it, it grows vegetables for us that we can use, or it contributes to good tree health. And uh, part of it runs down, let's say, and is picked up in the gutter, uh, ends up in the Rio Grande, and by the time it leaves Albuquerque, it's been siphoned off again into the city's water system, where it's cleaned again and used. And so... Our trick, our, our challenge, if you will, is to try to use water multiple times before it leaves our area. And I think we're getting better at that. The city of Albuquerque, for instance, has recycled water available in the South Valley, in the Southeast Heights, in the North Valley, and uh, near Paseo del Norte, let's say. And large-scale users, such as the Journal Center, have converted their use of potable water, fresh water for landscape irrigation to secondary water that's maybe been part of processing uh, microchips okay. in chip plants or, or it's, it's been otherwise previously used but now it's used for landscape irrigation purposes and al along the line we're putting it back in the ground in, in very useful ways and through a period of months or years or even decades it's going back into the ground to recharge our aquifers. And we're actually seeing that that's the case in Albuquerque's aquifers. In some cases, the most hard-pressed of our aquifers and our well, uh, uh, well uh, sit stations in the Northeast Heights in Albuquerque uh, have seen an increase of, of 16 to 20 feet this year in the height of the aquifer. The aquifer is coming back because of less pressure on it. Uh, more conservation, better xeriscaping, uh, reuse of, of secondary water. All those, uh, all those things are helping. So if you're using um, basically municipal gray water to say water in an enormous campus like, journal, like the Journal Center, there is, a, there is an infrastructure issue involved that you have to get the gray water over there. Is that a, uh, that doesn't seem to be an insurmountable problem, but uh, to my little mathematical mind, I'm wondering how much it costs. Uh, I guess what I really want to ask is what is the difference between the cost of using gray water and using groundwater? When we think about landscape irrigation in New Mexico and the Southwest, one uh, challenge always pops to the forefront, and that is that unless you're thinking about supplemental irrigation, an underground irrigation system, whether it's conventional or a drip system, 
you are not going to be realistic about your landscape improvements, especially in an urban setting. You have to use irrigation to yeah. keep the plants in good condition. One thing that happens to them is out in nature, they grow in natural plant communities. Yeah. You'll have a certain kind of tree, a certain kind of shrub, and a certain kind of ground cover in the foothills or up in the Ponderosa forest or out in the desert, let's say. And that's the kind of plant system or association that knows how to take care of itself. It's evolved because it's picking up runoff water. It's adapted to uh, snow that falls in the winter. Mm -hmm. And it's used to the summer monsoons. But what we do in a city, be it for any number of reasons, is we create designed landscapes that sometimes mimic natural landscapes fairly well. And sometimes they're just fine arts creations that stand on their own. And so when, you, when you're doing that, working up a, an urban landscape, what you will find is that these natural plant associations don't exist anymore. The watering systems that normally would keep them in good condition are gone. Everything's interrupted. We have concrete over here. We have asphalt over there, a line of buildings somewhere, a freeway, a power line. Something's always going on to interfere with their natural life processes. So an irrigation system makes up for that, compensates for that. It allows plants in unusual combinations in an urban setting to thrive. And those are those plant combinations, along with the hard landscape features such as patios and sidewalks and benches, those kinds of things. That's what we call an urban landscape. So when we design an urban landscape, whether it's a park or a courtyard or an office complex, the, the outdoor spaces of that kind of uh, construct, what we're looking to do is to set up a comprehensive irrigation system. And that may work well for a, a well-done system. Well, it should work well for 25 or 30 years. Ten years into its life, the city of Albuquerque or some other city comes along and says, we now have available recycled water. Mm -hmm. And we think it's a good idea because of this idea of using one drop of water three or four times before it leaves the county or leaves the city. So we're trying to recycle continually and hang on to the water as long as we can. We'd like to provide this water to you. Uh, would you be able to convert from potable water to uh, recycled water? And the answer is yes, and your infrastructure is completely in place. You've got valves, you've got a controller, you've got solenoids, you've got irrigation heads. They're all ready to work. All you have to do is bring in the new supply of water. And so you bring that in, and there's, there's a charge for that sort of hookup. And then you have to tag your system. You color code it so, and, so that it's recognizably reused water because the city is very much concerned with public health, safety, and welfare, mm. and it doesn't really want people drinking reused water. That's not one of its uses. Right. Its uses are landscape irrigation. So you do have this uh, added cost of tagging your system and making sure that it's color-coded so people understand that it's it's not potable water that you're dealing with. But the cost of doing that compared to putting in a brand new irrigation system that's using recycled water for a landscape space, 25% uh, of the original cost or less. So it's the the key is the recycled water itself. Is it available in the area in which your landscape is located? If the owner has a substantial landscape and wants to use recycled water, but the, the non-potable lines have to be run two miles to reach the site, that's where the cost tends to go up. And the city is trying very hard, I must say, the city of Albuquerque to solve that problem by making recycled water as widely available as it can. So how are the, uh, the street tree medians, um, is that the right term I guess it is, how are they watered? Uh, are, are they using gray water or larger runoff, or both? Well, Barrett, for many years after World War II, Albuquerque was expanding at uh, a boomtown pace. It, it was a boomtown. So it grew from the old town and downtown areas, mostly eastward for about 20 years, but also westward. And the city grew so fast that its streets were built incompletely. They were 75% complete streets. 
So the the traffic worked pretty well. You could drive up and down a street and get through an intersection, you know, maybe wading through one or two light changes. But uh, you were often driving down a street that had a barren median, not even any weeds. The parkways, the landscape strips on both sides of the street, which lie between the back of the curb and the front of the sidewalk, not planted. And as often as not in... Uh, residential areas, you would have gray cinder block walls. We call them CMU walls in, in <laughs> landscape architecture, six feet tall. And they would line the streets for miles right. in the Northeast Heights. Right. So the story. streets the streets are incomplete. They're not planted. They're not pleasant for people to walk along. And I heard for most of my life, people walking around the Northeast, Northeast Heights and saying, I don't have any inclination to even go for a walk during the summer. It's too hot out there. It's The concrete's hot. The sidewalks are too hot. I don't want to walk three blocks in this. There isn't a shade tree. There's no place to sit. When I get to a corner, I take my life in my hands trying to cross. Uh, yes, the streets work for cars. Do they work for people? Do they really work for pedestrians? That was the question. So a rising consciousness in Albuquerque about the fact that, that the city streets were incomplete began, I would say, in the 1970s, began to build up more steam in the 1980s. By the 1990s, the city was actively landscaping the medians in the middle of the road and sometimes the parkways on the sides of the road all over the Northeast Heights and the West Mesa and the South Valley. So it, this was beginning to happen everywhere, but the city planners looked at the challenge of trying to complete all these boomtown streets that had been built over a 60-year period, 50-year period, and suddenly realized that it had 170 miles of streets that had to be landscaped. Now, one of the difficulties was tied to who owns the water that actually arrives in Albuquerque. If there's a big snowfall and there's water running in the street, in the gutters, is that city water or state water? If we get a, <laughs> this is true, yeah. if we get a big rainstorm in July or August and the water hits the streets, is that water in the streets city water or is it state water? Who owns it? Technically, if the water is on the streets, on its way to the gutters, it belongs to the state of New Mexico, and the state engineer has a keen interest in it because it flows into the Rio Grande, it goes into Elephant Butte Reservoir and then Caballo Reservoir, and we may have to use it to satisfy our water requirements uh, imposed by, agreed upon by the Interstate Stream Commission with Texas right. and with Mexico. So for a long time, the argument was, whose water is it? Is it city water? Is it uh, private individual's water in a backyard? Is it state water? What is it? One thing that we did when we were first asked by the city to begin to lay out what we call a prototype median landscapes for the city was to develop a template of design that would work to landscape 160 plus miles of streets fast. Because if we didn't do five or ten miles of new streetscapes a year, the chances were it would take 20 or 30 years before the city's streets were complete because they're three-quarter complete streets. So how do we do that quickly, and how do we do it efficiently, and how do we capture some of that water that's falling on the city and hang on to it for our purposes? And we found that the simplest solution that's had the greatest success to date is to take the tops of the medians, which are level right now, from the top of one curb to another, and invert the crowns, turn them into a V. Yeah. So the middle part of the median drops down 18 inches or so, and all the water that falls onto the median remains city water. And yeah. so we concentrate all that water in the medians. We can't capture the water running down the streets because technically it belongs to the state, but the median we can capture the water in. And so we developed our streetscape plan with this idea in mind. The typical module that you use when you're designing a landscape is a tree, a boulder, a space of gravel, a shrub, 
uh, some ground cover, maybe a bench, something like that. You think of landscapes in terms of all the individual objects in them. We developed a pattern of landscape modules for the medians that are 50 feet long, 100 feet long, 250 feet long, and everything within that module is the design element that we're dealing with. Oh. So we have big elements that we deal with, and we're able to uh, put out design and put out to bid large-scale landscape design packages that allow contractors to build sometimes up to three or four miles of streetscapes all at once, quickly and very efficiently, especially utilizing this inverted crown and check dams when we have runoffs in the medians that also capture the water. And the water that we capture not only helps to water the trees and the shrubs in the medians, it recharges the aquifer. Sure. So that's what we're doing with the medians. We're trying to accomplish several things at the same time. And uh, in the process, we've been able to consistently reduce the temperatures in the streets to increase the carbon dioxide absorption, to increase the generation of oxygen in the streets, and to provide color that runs through all four seasons. So the medians are now something that are they're very pleasant. As you go along the streets, they work if you're a driver, and they make it more accommodating for pedestrians going up and down streets to utilize those, those street areas. But the key is, how fast can we do this and how thoroughly? And uh, so far, I think we've done about 80 miles wow. of, of streetscapes. Wow. And when I say we, I mean the city of Albuquerque and uh, a lot of hardworking contractors and people in my office. It's a, it's a team effort. So I'd really like to ask you sort of like two questions. One, I want to c kind of wrap up on the stream unions. We, we do artificially water them, too, I believe, if I'm not incorrect. And two... Uh, what is the what is the virtue of using native species uh, uh, versus uh, exotic species? Uh, and isn't indeed the elm uh, the greatest example of a successful exotic species in elm? <laughs> Thanks for that very good question, Barrett. Um, of of course, we irrigate the medians. We want to make sure that the cities. Uh, very strong investment in landscaping the medians is guaranteed and, and backed up by a good irrigation system. You don't want to spend a lot of money improving streets and making medians really attractive and not have a, a good system to support them. So it's the maintenance system for the medians. And uh, uh, the irrigation is supplemented, of course, by the natural rainfall and snowfall that we've been talking about too. In the case of medians that are located near sources of gray water or recycled water for the city, we're currently looking into using that as much as we possibly can. So once again, it's in keeping with this idea of using a drop of water three or four times before it leaves the county. And your second question had to do with native trees or, or shrubs versus exotic trees or shrubs that come from somewhere else. Oftentimes, you, you do indeed want to use native plants because they give you a better sense of place. Yeah. They help Albuquerque to feel like, a, like itself, like it's a part of the, the Southwest, a very important part of the Southwest, I might add. And uh, by using proper native species, in good plant associations, such as the ones we were talking about a few minutes ago, you're able to help Albuquerque feel more like it's in its own place. It's part of the Southwest and it's part of the high desert. That being said, many times an exotic plant, one that's been cultivated for harsh urban conditions that can survive without a great deal of water and care, is a good choice for a, a median or streetscape project. And of course, what always pops to mind is everybody's favorite tree to hate, the Siberian elm. <laughs> Ever since Clyde Tingley introduced it, along with the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s, it's been found all over New Mexico, and it's jumped the garden wall long since, and, and it has naturalized itself. Siberian elms are beautiful trees, and if you look at them on their own terms, especially in their winter form, you'll be hard-pressed to find a tree that's more beautiful. That being said, it 
sends its roots down into people's water lines and it breaks foundations and it sends out these enormous gobs of seeds in the spring and it drives everyone nuts. So what we are trying to do is to use a better behaved cousin of the Siberian elm and that's called the lace bark elm. And the lace bark elm is the true Chinese elm. It has, you know, the Siberian's elm is like your cousin Henry who never learned to eat with a knife and fork. And, <laughs> and you're, you're reluctant to ask him over for Thanksgiving because people just cover their eyes when they watch him help himself at the table. Um, the lace bark elm has been to finishing school. It really knows how to behave. It's a beautiful tree that doesn't produce a lot of seeds. Its roots are uh, nicely placed. Tends to they tend to go down in the soil. The lace bark gets about two thirds the size of the Siberian elm, and it has a beautiful form and shape. And it, as if that weren't enough, the trunk of the lace bark elm is is just stunning. It it looks like a like the trunk of a sycamore. It's it has a beautiful kind of mottled, uh, exfoliating. Uh, quality to it, multiple colors, and we found that to be a really sturdy median tree, and we're trying to use those where we otherwise would be using a Siberian elm. So not all exotics are bad, but I, given my preferences, I do like to use local native species because I think they give you a, a better sense of local quality and character, and uh, they're not necessarily lower in water use, but uh, Long term, they survive quite well in the medians. So while we know that a lot of um, rural forests in New England are beginning to come back, uh, we also hear uh, and read from, uh, from various sources that urban forests around America are having a hard time, particularly in, in I believe, Midwestern cities and even Western cities, too. That doesn't mean that they're, that they're all dying out, but they're... They, they're being written about as if they're threatened. Could you, as a kind of a wrap-up to this wonderful discussion, could we, could you throw a light on what, on what might be happening and how we can avoid that here? Urban forests around the country suffer from a lot of problems, and the problems are innate to cities. In the last 10 years or so, it will be news to nobody that we've had quite a few problems with recessions economic recessions. And so maintenance cutbacks are, are pretty ubiquitous across the United States. And urban trees take care. I mean, they, they take a lot of tender, loving care or they don't thrive. So many maintenance crews, maintenance efforts, uh, parks departments across the country in cities large and small have been cut to bare bones and the trees aren't getting the kind of attention that they used to get. Secondly, we have invaders like Japanese beetles uh, in, invading the east coast of the United States, coming in on shipments of wood or wood crates, and at the moment devastating ash forests. And that is just uh, very typical of the process of globalization that all of us think about as well today. We have a freer exchange of goods and we have a freer exchange of pests. and. Uh, Insect pests in North America that come from Europe or Asia or South America, Africa, may not have the same enemies that control them coming along with them. And so cut loose, uh, turn loose on our native vegetation, they can cause a lot of damage. Dutch elm disease just a few years ago did much the same thing with elm species all over the country. Same with chestnuts. So we, we have lower budgets. We have the problem of invading foreign species, and then we have all the typical problems that assail street trees, let's say, all over the United States. Soot is a huge problem, especially with conifers, evergreen trees. They can't shed their leaves like deciduous trees can. So they get covered with soot and grime from urban conditions, and those uh, elements just sit on the needles of the trees. They can't be, they can't be cleaned. Soil gets compacted along sidewalks and in medians by foot traffic and vehicular traffic. And trees need looser soil in order to breathe. Their roots ac actually have to breathe and uh, absorb water. And so intensive compaction is always a problem with street trees. Irrigation systems 
that formerly may not have been needed in some cities because of abundant rainfall in the past are now necessary because of uh, increasing dryness or droughts. Global uh, warming yeah. is probably playing a, a, a role in the decline of health of many of our street trees around the country. And then because of the limitations of budgets, when street trees decline, and they normally have a lifespan of 25 to 30 years, um, they're not being replaced as quickly as, as they formerly were. So it's a combination of difficulties that street trees place. And if you deal with all of them systematically, you'll get a better result. And I think with the recession ending and municipal budgets and state budgets, county budgets improving just the last two or three years, we can expect to see an increase in tree health in general across the United States. And uh, I think Albuquerque's been an exemplary city in, in both promoting additional street tree planting and in promoting the planting of street trees in, in very difficult growing conditions like our freeways, yeah. the Big Eye and other uh, big interchanges, in which we've noticed, uh, I'll just end with this, we've noticed an astonishing thing. Very, very difficult for a plant to thrive along a, a busy thoroughfare or a highway. But we have discovered in Albuquerque that the increased presence of what we can only think is CO2 in places like the, the crossway uh, at uh, I-40 and I-25, that increased CO2 has led to about a doubling of growth of all of our trees. Okay. They're growing twice as fast as they, as they normally should, and the same with the shrubs. So we think it's because of, of increased levels of CO2. Great. That's a great story. <laughs> so, I tell you, it's just a, a real joy to talk with someone who knows what they're talking about. You know, we're all interested in this, I think, even if we don't express it often. But, you know, trees really are a part of our lives and a part of our civilization. And uh, they help to make us healthy and then they help to keep us sane. So it's wonderful to talk with you today, and I really appreciate it, Bake. It's just been great fun. Thank you, Barrett. Great pleasure.